Before we get started, thanks for coming in this morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Gary Weeks, who's the head of the section uh, of cardiology and the medical director of the cath lab at Northwest Hospital and what will become the Northwest campus uh, for the University of Washington School of Medicine. Uh, so uh, Gary uh, uh, did his um, uh, medical training at Northwestern University in Chicago, did his medical uh, training um, uh, after that uh, at what at the time was New England Deaconess Hospital, but what we probably all call, call BID now, um, and then uh, the VA at Harvard, uh, did his interventional cardiology training at Brown University, uh, and then went on to hold a, a number of uh, positions, uh, including at Harvard and then at Mayo, but for a very long time, which I won't uh, enumerate. Um, you've been uh, at uh, Summit Cardiology uh, here in Seattle um, and have held a, a wide range of roles, um, including those I mentioned, um, but also uh, been involved in clinical trials uh, as well as um, the uh, participating on the anticoagulation uh, committee uh, for many, many years for the University of Washington um, and Northwest Hospital. So it's really nice to have you here to tell us a little bit about your work and um, what all of this looks like from a community perspective, I think, which will be particularly interesting uh, to a lot of people in the audience. So thanks for, yeah. All right, well, thanks very much. Um, I appreciate the invitation. Uh, I appreciate Greg reaching out to us. So as you know, Northwest and UW have been dating for quite a while. Um, the marriage is about to occur. And so I think it's a great idea to establish a spirit of collegiality, uh, collaboration. And so my goal today is to um, try to give you a little bit of insight into what uh, we're doing up at Northwest. For all the fellows, I thought it would be an interesting thing to get an idea about life beyond the hallowed halls of academia. So maybe uh, the fellows will be able to get a chance to see what life in clinical practice is like. Uh, Greg had originally suggested that I could spend the entire hour talking about Northwest. However, I concluded that if I did that and published in the media the flyer that we were going to talk for an hour about cardiac services, that one, nobody would show up, or two, halfway through the talk, you would be so bored that all the pagers would start going off and everybody would leave. Um, so I'm going to restrict the Northwest aspect to about 15 minutes and then hopefully go into it, what it will be a more substantive discussion about the role of myocardial viability assessment in decision-making in the setting of coronary artery disease. So of course, I'd like to make this interactive. Please go ahead and uh, feel free to ask questions. I'll try to move through this fairly quickly. I actually started in 1990 with Jack Murray uh, and George Frank and Phil Hall. So Jack, uh, thanks for the introduction to Seattle. It's been a long run, which has been good. Um, Summit Cardiology uh, was started in 1984 at Northwest, or 1987 by two guys, Fred Tobus and Dan Wilkinson. Um, they came from the Summit Madison Medical Group. That's where the name Summit Cardiology arose. And then uh, Peg Hall and I joined in the early 1990s. And in 1994, we entered into a employment agreement with Northwest Hospital, which at the time was a little bit unusual for a private practice group to enter uh, into an employment agreement with a community hospital. Um, in 1995, we opened the cardiac cath lab. Um, we actually did what was sort of unique at the time. We created a collaborative relationship with Ed Barrier and with Gabe Aldea, and the UW Cardiac Surgical Program opened in 1995 at Northwest Hospital. And in the heyday of coronary artery bypass graft surgery, we were actually doing about 120 open heart surgeries throughout the early 2000s. About three years ago, for reasons of volume as well as manpower within cardiac surgery, uh, the cardiac surgical program was put on hold. But we actually still have a certificate of need for cardiac surgery. Uh, we started doing our coronary interventional program in 1995. So who are we in the outpatient arena? Um, we see about 10,000 uh, established patient visits yearly. We see about 1,700 consultations and new patient visits. Uh, our echo lab has been accredited since 2007. We do about 3,100 TEs and TTEs yearly, 550 stress echoes. 
Our nuclear lab has been accredited since 2004. We do about 1,100 uh, myocardial perfusion scans yearly. We've had a full service uh, diagnostic peripheral uh, vascular lab since 2002 accredited, doing about 1,600 ultrasound studies yearly. And we've had the UW cardiac rehab program since 1996, seeing about 5,400 patients yearly. Um, so who are we? Uh, Julie Hine is our director of the ECHO lab and director of cardiac rehab. Chetan Bungodi does nuclear cardiology, invasive cardiology, and general cardiology. Uh, David Worth and I are the interventionalists. So David does general and interventional cardiology. I do general interventional and also peripheral <laughs> vascular interventions. Uh, Dan Wilkinson is our EP person. Dan's going to retire at the end of the year, and we have a new EP, Basil Sauer. Marco Yakovovich is our director of the nuclear lab, does nuclear and general cardiology. We have two nurse practitioners. Mickey Dalstra is our inpatient NP. Jen Branham is our electrophysiology NP. Uh, we do have three new members who have joined us. Some of you may have met Basil Sauer, who's our new electrophysiologist. He's been doing work down here. Uh, Steve Dodge will start November 1 doing general and echo, and Meredith Parr is a new PA who will be doing outpatient work. So what is it like in the real world out there? Um, we, uh, on average, uh, have about eight half days a week in the office, so we are very uh, office-based in most of our practices. We do a 15-minute return patient time and 30-minute new patient time, so we are moving, as it were, staying busy. Uh, on average, oops, on average, we see about 14 return patients, two to three new patients on a daily basis. Um, in the hospital, we rotate one week and five through the hospital for a week at a time. We have uh, one full-time doc in the hospital and a doc who's there for a half a day in the morning, office in the afternoon. Uh, we have uh, one office-based APP who does ur urgent follow-ups, hospital follow-ups, and so on. So, you know, we're a busy practice. We keep moving. Uh, we see a lot of patients. The real question is, how about quality assessment? You know, we can say we're very busy, but how do we know we're actually doing a good job in our quality of care? And that's a more elusive metric, I would have to say. So for those of you who know about quality assessment in the outpatient, in the absence of a structured database in which we can track individual patients longitudinally, it's really hard to get an idea about quality of care. Um, so some of the measures which we had, and I'll have, and I'll just run through this quickly. So the MIPS payment system, merit-based incentive payment system, is CMS's quality measure. And it looks at these different metrics, 45% quality, 15% cost, 15% improvement activity, and then 25% promoting interoperability, that is communicating with other institutions electronically. So MIPS is one measure of outpatient quality. The problem is that these measures are not uh, cardiac specific. So how did we do in 2018? Well, for Medicare, we got a score of 97.5. And um, basically what you can see is that we uh, didn't do too well on our quality measure. And we'll get into a little explanation of that in a minute. In terms of our promoting interoperability, improvement activities, costs, we all did very well. So. We got a positive score from Medicare, so we made a few bucks uh, in terms of our additional payment. Does this truly review uh, the measures of quality? Um, so here's the Medicare website, how we could have done better. And there are some opportunities for improvement here. Our diabetes hemoglobin A1Cs are too high, but we're really not managing diabetes. And we clearly are failing on our breast cancer screening. So um, these are the, some of the issues related to the MIPS assessment of quality. Um, if you look at cardiac specific measures in terms of ACE and ARB therapy and LV systolic dysfunction, we do well. So, you know, that's one metric. Um, cost is another one. And 
I'm sure you've all read Dean's, Dean Ramsey's uh, missives about the importance of cost in patient-focused care. Uh, so in cost, we do well. We get a 10 out of a 10 score. So we are a low-cost provider, and so that may have some relevance as we move forward in uh, the future. Um, so uh, patient satisfaction scores, you may be familiar with the press Ganey top box score. Uh, this is Summit Cardiology for the three months of April, May, and June 2019, and basically showing respect, explaining things, listening to the patient, spending enough time, knowing the medical history and giving easy instruction. So on average, 94% of our patients give us the top rating out of an eight point scale. So for whatever it's worth, the perception of care on the patient's behalf is good. So we're, we're proud of that metric. Um, inpatient services, what do we do on the inpatient side? Um, we have one full-time MD, half day MD, one full-time ARNP, our average census is about 17. We get six to eight consults or admissions daily. Uh, we do about 380 diagnostic casts yearly with four operators. We do about 270 coronary interventions, atherectomy and LV support uh, procedures yearly with two operators. Uh, we do pacers, ICD, loop recorders, EP studies, ablations, and peripheral vascular interventions. So you can see from our numbers that in terms of procedural volumes, we are meeting all the recommended guidelines for uh, numbers of procedures per physician uh, to continue to provide good care. Quality metrics on the inpatient side, again, difficult, um, but emergent cardiac care is one of our focuses. So we track closely every door to balloon time. We do try to have a close relationship with our local medic shoreline and uh, medic one. Our average door to balloon time, 55 minutes. Uh, we're uh, actually very thankful that first medical contact to balloon time is at 81 minutes, which is actually a pretty astounding uh, number to think mm -hmm. that from the time the medics hit the door in the home to uh, a coronary intervention, uh, 81 minutes, I think is well within um, a high standard of care. 97% of the time we meet this 90 minute door to bloom time. Um, now we participate in an NCDR. Uh, I could show 8,000 metrics on our NCDR outcomes. Um, I think that the take home message is that we are aware of what we're doing. We track all these measures. There's opportunity for improvement. If you look at composite guideline medications prescribed at discharge, so the PCI patient who gets aspirin, a PPY12 inhibitor, a statin, and a beta blocker on a consistent basis, we're average. We don't do much better than average. We're about 95% successful, which is about 50th percentile. I'll attribute part of that to our archaic medical records, Sorian. I don't know if anybody's had the distinct pleasure of working with Sorian, but it has no clinical decision support <laughs> algorithms. Uh, hopefully in October 2020, when EPIC comes in, we'll have to be able to do a little bit more robust work in terms of the clinical decision support. If you basically forget to order the statin on the discharge medication be, because it wasn't apparent, you know, you get dinged on that. In terms of more substantive uh, outcome measures, emergency cabbage, uh, we have um, about a point 4% need for emergent open heart surgery in our PCIs, none in the last three years. If you look at uh, stroke rates, uh, we've had uh, one stroke in the past four years. Uh, transfusions post PCI, we're about the 75th percentile in terms of low need for transfusions post PCI. So again, I think the relevant issue is that we're tracking these metrics. If we see something get out of whack, then we try to move on and have a focused intervention in that regard. Uh, other inpatient quality measures, uh, readmission data, a lot of talk about readmissions. I would say we're average. Uh, our readmission rate for MI and heart failure is about average for the national rates. Mortality rates are about average. Um, we are a lower cost center as described, so our average Medicare payments 
are lower in comparison with other folks. Um, let's see. So, in summary, uh, you know, a quick run through. I think the conclusions that I'd like to present to the group would be that we do have a full spectrum of tertiary level cardiac services. The only things we're not currently doing are uh, cardiac surgery and structural heart. Uh, maybe some opportunities there. Uh, we meet uh, ICA accreditation on all of our uh, diagnostic imaging services. We're meeting all of our procedural volume requirements to maintain proficiency in our procedural cases. We have very high patient satisfaction scores, but we do clearly have a need for more robust quality outcomes program. We ne need dedicated analysts. We need the tools to be able to support quality improvement. So with that, I will open up the floor. That was a real quick run through. Questions, comments. I can see it's been a stultifying presentation here. Let's move on to something that I hope will be a little bit more substantive here. But quickly, what do we need to do in the future? We need to grow our general cardiac program. Hopefully Northwest will become the site for general cardiology. We need to have outreach clinics, you know that Cardiac services are pyramids. We really need to build our bulk up our general cardiology to be the quaternary work. Um, there is opportunity for a cardiology driven cardiac CT and MR program. Um, we need the expertise, we need the folks interested in that. Um, we would like to expand structural heart to low risk structural heart procedures, low risk CAVR, PFO closure, LIA closure. Um, we would like to have a cardiac surgeon up at the office uh, for consultations. Uh, cardiac surgery at Northwest in the future, we've talked for years and years about that. Rob has his own thoughts about that. We won't go there right now. Um, <laughs> but of course, we're going to have to be involved in education. And if this is the general cardiology site for the UW Medicine Center, uh, education will be an incredibly important component. So I'd like to get now, move into the second half of the talk, uh, case presentation. Uh, so this is a 62 year old male. He's had 20 years of type two diabetes. Um, he presented in 2014 with heart failure, has never had anginal symptoms. His angiogram at the, or his echo at the time showed severe LV dysfunction with inferior akinesis, global hyperkinesis. Coronary angiogram showed fairly advanced three vessel disease, occluded right coronary artery, well developed left right collaterals, and moderate stenoses and LAD, trifurcation marginal, proximal circumplex, and diffuse distal circumplex disease. He was managed medically with carvedilol, lysanopril, atorvastatin, aspirin, metformin, and insulin. Uh, he was stable and had class two to three heart failure symptoms, no angina and he was managed medically. In 2016, again presented with heart failure, started on diuretic therapy, was intolerant to ACEs and ARBs because of hyperkalemia. He was advised to consider revascularization. He wasn't interested, he was doing pretty well. Um, then in 2018, recurrent class three heart failure symptoms, he had an angiogram showing some progression of disease, and he was referred to the cardiac surgical clinic here, as well as to the heart failure clinic. So this is his initial coronary angiogram. You can see that there's very diffuse disease. Oh, okay, let's see if I can play this. Well, let me move on to the next one. Here's again his uh, angiogram showing well-developed left-right collaterals, left main disease, osteal LAD, mid LAD, uh, high-grade trifurcation marginal stenosis. Um, and you can see the diffuse distal left circumflex. Here's his right coronary artery. Um, I'm sure Lombardi would love to have a go at this one, but we won't go there. Um, so we underwent diagnostic testing, uh, echo we've talked about previously, EF of 25%. At the recommendation of the surgeon, he had a viability study with cardiac MR, and basically 
I mean, it showed what would be expected. LGE in the inferior and for lateral walls, consistent with infarction. However, non-viable myocardium, only 11% of the total by, uh, myocardial mass. He had CPEP studies done, only achieved 32% of his predicted maximum. And he underwent a pharmacologic nuclear scan showing no ischemia, although one could wait, raise the question, is it just a balanced ischemia? And hence, we don't really see a positive finding. So I'm going to pick on some people here. Let's see, who can I pick on? Who wants to continue medical therapy alone? The guy's class two to three, he has no angina. He kind of pokes around and he's perfectly happy. Who wants to, anybody want to continue medical therapy alone? No takers. Okay. How about bypass surgery? Well, we sent him to the surgeon, so obviously that's what we concluded he needed. Um, who wants to do PCI? <clears throat> Okay, well, uh, Dr. Dean has requested a, or some feedback. What, <clears throat> what did the surgeons think about the opportunity for bypass? Well, I can tell you, they turned him down. They said he's got horrible LD function and he's got horrible distal disease. We're not interested. So, Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So, well, Dr. Lombardi has raised a couple of good uh, questions here. Um, the issue of, do you need a nuke scan? Um, we're going to go review the STITCH trial. And interestingly, STITCH, which we'll go over here shortly, did not require ischemia for entry into the STITCH trial. So one will have to ask, do we even need to do ischemia testing in this subset of patients? The other question is the physiologic assessment of the distal uh, left main proximal LAD. We did go on to actually do that. And he did have a, an IFR of about 0 0.72 in the LAD. Um, and so we felt that there was physiologic significance within the proximal LAD. Um, <clears throat> and for those of you who don't want to make any decisions in clinical practice, you could do more testing. Let's do some more testing. Okay, so what did we do? Uh, we've already said that the surgeon said we're really not interested. So. Like any self-respecting interventional program, you guys are all used to this, but we did the uh, impella-supported uh, four-vessel PCI uh, stents. Uh, so after viability or uh, physiology testing showing significant uh, left anterior descending artery, left main, trifurcation marginal, we treated LAD, left main, trifurcation marginal, and circumflex, and this was our outcome. So. I present this simply to show that while we are a dinky little community hospital up in the hinterlands, we actually do have some fairly sophisticated capabilities in terms of our cardiac uh, services delivery. So, um, so what's the evidence base? I think that's the real question. What's the evidence base for our decision making here? And uh, we've uh, touched the aspect of presence or absence of ischemia. I think in this patient subset, severe LV dysfunction, diffuse three vessel disease, we probably don't have to demonstrate ischemia before we make recommendations. Oh, and Lombardi, I'm sorry we didn't tackle that RCA, but we're gonna leave that one for you, okay? <clears throat> right, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, all right. Very good. Fortunately, Bill and I have known each other for longer than I would like to know. But um, so, uh, how about the presence or absence of viability? Does that affect, affect our decision making in this setting? 
Is there survival benefit from revascularization in this setting? I think we probably know that answer. And then finally, is there any evidence regarding the comparative benefits for cabbage versus PCI? That remains a little bit more elusive. So I wanted to briefly review the STITCH trial. So for those of us with gray hair, Larry Dean and myself, we probably remember the STITCH trial. Uh, it started in 2002, 1,200 patients with low ejection fractions and coronary disease amenable to bypass. No requirement for ischemia, um, no requirement for anginal symptoms, just coronary disease suitable for, inter or for revascularization. Randomized to cabbage plus medical therapy versus medical therapy alone. Primary outcome, death from any cause. Secondary outcome, death from cardiovascular causes or death from any cause plus hospitalization for cardiovascular causes. So this was the original 10-year data presented in 2011. I'm sorry, in 2016. And you can see that there is a significant survival benefit with bypass surgery in this patient group compared to medical therapy. If you look at death from cardiovascular causes, about a 14% absolute reduction in death from cardiovascular causes. And then obviously the third parameter, the death from any cause plus hospitalization significantly reduced. So I think we can conclude that in this patient subset, even if they don't have ischemia, they benefit from revascularization. Now, just published in August in uh, NEJM was their 10-year data on myocardial viability and long-term outcomes. And basically, half of the patients had a myocardial viability assessment. <clears throat> they either had spec or dobutamine echo. The definition of viability for spec was one or 11 or more viable segments based on relative patient activity. This was a dichotomous definition of viability. Dobutamine echo viability defined as five or more segments with resting hypokinesis manifesting contractual reserve during dobutamine. So how did it, uh, how did the issue of viability relate to changes in ejection fraction following initiation of either medical therapy or revascularization? And I guess it's not surprising if people had no viable myocardium, they didn't get any better after either medical therapy or revascularization. The groups that did have a modest improvement in ejection fraction improved actually the same, whether medical therapy was started or whether they underwent revascularization. So I thought it was interesting that revascularization was not superior to medical therapy and improvement in LV function. How about the issue of viability in relation to uh, survival and, and the improvement in ejection fraction related to survival? And basically you can see that People who had improvement in ejection fraction did not have improved survival compared to those with no improvement in ejection fraction. Now, it kind of runs in, uh, counterintuitive to our you know, long-held uh, position that a survival is really dependent upon level of ejection fraction. So I thought this was an interesting outcome from the trial. Now, admittedly, ejection fraction was only assessed at baseline and four months post randomization, so maybe they didn't get adequate time to demonstrate improvement. The magnitude of benefit was small, a 2.2% improvement in ejection fraction in the viable group. So I think the most interesting thing is the relationship between viability and outcomes with either revascularization or medical therapy. And Basically, those without viable myocardium, this is death from any cause, had about the same survival as those with viable myocardium. Um, if you look at patients without viable myocardium, randomized bypass or medical therapy, no difference. That's not surprising, I would guess. Those with viability, no statistically significant improvement with revascularization. So it, um, raises the question, do we need to be doing viability assessment? This is a complex group. 
little bit difficult to appreciate, but this was a, a test between the interaction between treatment assignment and myocardial viability status. And basically there was no significant benefit for revascularization in the group with viability. And um, so the uh, authors go on to conclude that the assessment of myocardial viability does not predict the likelihood of benefit from surgical revascularization in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. I see everybody's about to leave. I'm gonna wrap up shortly here, uh, but we fortunately have some time. Myocardial viability does predict the improvement in left ventricular function, whether people are treated medically or are treated with uh, revascularization. Improvement in LV function doesn't actually correlate with survival, which is, I think, an interesting concept. The authors did say that the um, degree of LV dysfunction and the number of stenotic coronary arteries is a stronger predict predictor of benefit from revascularization than is viability. So uh, there are limitations to the trial, of course. Only half the patients in the overall trial had viability studies. <clears throat> the number of patients was relatively small in the viability substudy, so maybe we could be drawing inaccurate conclusions. Um, the determination of viability was this dichotomous variable, and maybe there were more nuanced degrees of viability, which would have, have allowed a better prediction of the benefit of myocardial viability. Uh, they didn't do cardiac MR. They did at the time what was standard spec and uh, dobutamine echo. Maybe they didn't have as much sensitivity. And finally, uh, LV function was assessed early post revascularization. Maybe we need the year, two years, three years that we see in clinical practice to actually manifest improvement in LV function with therapies. So um, I guess I'll throw it open to the group. Is there any indication for viability studies? Uh, Kevin, do you want to take that one on? Okay, Kevin's going to pass on that one. My conclusion, at least based upon this trial, would be if you have severe LV dysfunction with advanced coronary disease, don't bother with the surgical recommendation to get a viability study. Just go ahead and do it. That would be my conclusion. Any counter opinions? Any other opinions there? Okay, good. Oh, Bill, all right, good. Good, all right, Bill. We often do intentionally treat a procedure trials, which doesn't actually make sense because when you cross over, it should be the therapy received, not the intention to treat. And usually yeah. the therapy received doesn't work. I don't think I would go up to make a blanket statement saying we don't need viability testing prior to revascularization. Um, I think we do, but I think that needs to be done both surgically and percutaneously. Because either you do believe in viability, if you don't believe in viability, it's not whether there's a PCI. Yeah. Well, it's going to be very difficult for me to repeat all of that for the <laughs> Zoom audience. So, but Bill, I, I was going to let you address the third question here. Can we presume that the benefits of PCI are uh, comparable to the benefits of uh, coronary uh, of uh, surgical revascularization? And you know, the ex the five year outcomes from Excel was just presented at TCT, published in the New England Journal. So for uh, the randomized trial between uh, cardiac surgery and PCI, five year outcomes uh, started to show that uh, the primary endpoint, which was death MI and stroke uh, in the surgical group is now improving in comparison with the uh, PCI group. Bill, comments about that? I'm sure you have some.
Potentially, but you have to do it in a state of fashion, which means you have to have residual syntax score number four, you have to do image and physiologic based complete rebounds, and then maybe we'll have that same outcome. This trial is being currently run in the UK and I've been served it with the PCI testing and mapping. So in three to five years, hopefully we will have data to answer that question more clearly. Good. Um, well, I would concur we are in a uh, situation where we don't have definitive data, but um, I think that at this point for this gentleman, having uh, been declined for surgery, it was reasonable to proceed. Um, and then the final sort of question raised, why does an improvement in ejection fraction not translate into a survival benefit? I think we've addressed that. So, so Larry. <laughs> Right, uh, yeah, so I, I would concur, Dr. Dean has said, uh, for those on the Zoom audience, that this 2.2% improvement in injection fraction is probably not substantive enough to really translate into survival benefit. Yes, Greg. My question is actually, do you talk with your patients about that? And if so, how do you explain that? Because that's sort of a complex message for us to All right, so uh, Dr. Roth has raised the question that uh, survival early following bypass surgery is actually worse than medical therapy within the STITCH trial. But there's a crossover at about two years. And how do we explain that to our patients? That's a tough one, and I think for this particular gentleman, you can see he really was holding off, holding off, holding off. He didn't want to do anything, didn't want to do anything. I think we have to have the candid discussion that there's an upfront mortality risk with any procedure, and be it uh, cardiac surgery or PCI, we had to tell him that there is, uh, with PCI at least, going to be a possible 1% mortality risk, and with surgery, there's probably at least a 3 to 5% upfront mortality risk, but the benefit is the long-term gain and the long-term survival. And, and that's frankly where you just have to have an understanding relationship with your patient. Uh, uh, they will uh, want to undergo a procedure anticipating they'll have a 10-year survival or 15-year survival. Yeah. Well, it's complex. Uh, question back there? Yes. Um, 
Good. Well, I, I appreciate those comments. I would certainly agree that um, our testing does have some limitations that uh, the sicker the patient in terms of left ventricular dysfunction and greater degrees of uh, ischemia, but still preserve viability, will clearly translate into improved outcomes with revascularization. So uh, I'm not an imager. Uh, I appreciate the expertise that uh, our imaging folks have. And the real challenge, I think, is how do the imagers and the proceduralists work together to achieve a unified recommendation on these more complex patients? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation. Uh, we look forward to more collaboration between the two campuses, and I think it's an exciting time. Uh, change is always uh, difficult, particularly everybody up at our campus is a little bit worried. Is the big ship going to smother the little ship? Uh, but we look forward to the challenge. So thanks very much. <laughs>